start again here. <laughs> Where else was it? Oh, uh, talk about you know what drives Joe Sestak. You're talking about your family. Your, say, yeah, I, yes. I'd be happy. I said, and it came from my father. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and my mom, you know, immigrant from Slovakia. Yeah. Came over here before the depression. Father worked in a steel mill. He, my father went off to uh, World War II. Rose to be a Navy captain. As he raised eight kids with my mom, he, we were a Catholic family, and that. Catholic means community, coming together. But he wanted every one of his children to be all they could be. Every one he wanted to go to college. You see, it didn't take a penny for college, penny for education. A penny for, for college, food. penny for food. food. And, and then my mom, when the eighth of us went out to first grade, she went out the door with, with us and started teaching high school math. <laughs> And that sense of contributing and then coming home, that's the, to be, you know, yeah. to have this community all the time, but to also great individuals, that's where I got it from, was from the family. I, I, I'm, great Catholic school I went to, Cardinal Harrah, I still tell everybody, yeah. the best okay. school I ever went to, right. and uh, I loved it. But then the service imbued those principles even, or ingrained them deeper into me. When I was captain of that ship, I knew that I was responsible for men and women your I'm lives were right. respons you were responsible for their lives and there but I was also I was accountable to this nation for them then when I entered Congress it was for the livelihoods of people I felt that the government should just make the rules fair people are responsible for themselves but it should be in a fair environment so when you have a youth that is growing up in the streets that is homeless or something that's not a fair environment and America doesn't benefit if we aren't able to get them on the first rung of that ladder for their individual sets where we all benefit. Yeah, it's hard to climb a ladder if you can't find it. That's right. Well put. Um, that sense of family that you talk about uh, kind of takes me back to some criticism you had during your campaign of having too much family <laughs> uh, running your campaign. Do you remember that? Uh, well, I guess, but we just kind of laughed about it. I can remember Bob Kennedy and all the Kennedy kids. And I had a wonderful book I was reading at the time. Uh, it was called, uh, it was about John Kennedy. Yeah. And uh, talked about how his family was such a part of the campaign. Look, when I entered politics after I got out of the Navy in 2006, I came right here to Delaware County. Mm -hmm. It was, I think, January 22nd. And it was eight months of the election. The one person outside my family, and Bill Walsh, a yeah. naval academy classmate, who grew up with me in the district, went off the Navy together, that I had told, was going to tell, was going to be the chairman here of the Democratic Party. So I'm just about to get in. He said, You better talk to the DCCC. I said, Delaware County Community College? <laughs> I said, No, the DCCC, the Delaware Congressional Campaign Committee. Rahm Emanuel headed it. So I said, OK. I'm I don't know why, but <laughs> so I called them because I didn't know what they were. Right. And the head of the air said, We don't want you in the race. We got something. Yeah, they already had a candidate. Yeah. So the next day I hung up, they called back the next day. They said, You're not getting in, are you? I said, well, Yeah, I wasn't asking permission. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I was just told I should inform you, and I did that. So Ram doesn't want you in, Ram Emanuel. And I said, well, that's fine, but uh, I'll be announcing here, I think it was February 22nd, okay. and I'm happy to talk to him, but I'll be announcing. So the morning of February 22nd, I saw him, of course, you know, he's a fait accompli and went in. Yeah. Uh, there was, you know, and so that's kind of how it, 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 it came about that my family became involved, because nobody really wanted anything to do with us. None of the pros from Dover would get involved either in that campaign initially, nor would any of them for the Senate campaign. I asked two people to be the campaign manager, and both of them said, when I'm involved in the Clinton campaign, when I'm involved in the mm -hmm. other can't touch it. Even f people who do fundraising wouldn't touch it because you'll cross the street and get a cross wires with a DS. Yeah, so, yeah. the so that was okay. I had a great team. My family were professionals. My sister Elizabeth has an MBA from Carnegie Mellon. My brother's a lawyer. My other sister was a lawyer's treasurer. And so we were involved and drove enthusiasm and all. And I, frankly, I think it's the prime reason why we did so well. Well, and of course, there were people you could trust implicitly, too. Absolutely. Um, and trust is in a deficit right now. Look, the established let me know they weren't going to support me. Well, <laughs> you know, who do you turn to that's involved in politics? Yes. The people. Yeah. People who care. And that's why we did so well. 
Well, uh, you and that's nothing against the establishment. Oh, yeah. They're fine people. It's yeah. just they were. They felt it was going to be done a certain way, and yeah, I wasn't well, going to agree to that. We've both butted heads with the establishment <laughs> in our time. We have that in common. Uh, you, you made a number of references to health care. Uh, I recall you saying your main motivation for getting into public service was health care because of the health care that you were able to get for your daughter when she was seriously ill. What do you think about the uh, challenges to Obamacare? And what do you think will happen if the Supreme Court strikes it down? There's two things. Number one is, I believe if it's struck down, that you will see us return to the days in 2006, just as I was running for Congress, where up to 500 Pennsylvanians every day were losing their health care because the affordability was going out of the room. Number two, is I honestly do believe that we will be a less competitive nation. We lose $150 billion a year, according to the Institute of Medicine, because of the under and uninsured, because when they get sick, because they don't have preventive care, they go to an emergency. And everyone else pays for it. Yes, that's the third thing. But they go to an emergency room and they're sicker longer and we lose yes. productivity. And the third is, you know, it's not right. And their outcomes tend paying, to be a lot worse. Pardon me? Their medical outcomes tend to be a Absolutely. lot worse because so they're in worse shape when they go to the emergency so, room. I don't think it's fair that, for instance, John, you should pay, on average, you know, when someone is married, you know, with a family, that they pay about $22,000 more for the uninsured. That's not right. They should be covered and have to do it that you don't have to pay for. And they should pay, you know, if they're poor, they should at least pay part of that. But as that thing goes up, they should break it. And that's how we did it. And you know what? It was a system that made the market fair. So, for example, here in Pennsylvania, we had have two health care insurance companies that own 85% of all the health insurance. It's a monopoly for yeah. the Department of Justice. And that's the same way it is across America. We tried to strip away do, that do, monopoly. Do you think the they, seven major successful. health care companies have basically carved up the markets across the country, so each one dominates each market? That's what's happening. According to the Department of Justice, antitrust division, 94% of all health care markets are controlled by one. A um, monopoly, yeah. or duopoly as in Pennsylvania. Right. And so therefore, if you can go to two places in Pennsylvania, you're going to get the exact same price. There's no competition, and that's the role to make sure that government does have a role to play. It needs to be explained better. It's not just that regular, it is to make it transparent so that the rules are fair, mm -hmm. so that that person who has put their life savings into a retirement plan, that the bank on Wall Street shouldn't be gambling his money because they don't have to tell you how many derivatives they traded in with whom, or what's the risk that's there. Right. Look, there's even a, or whether they're covering their bet on it. Absolutely. Look, there's even right here when you see the kids playing uh, little league uh, football. There's still a referee on the football field for that. That's all that we want to make sure the rules are to level playing field. Absolutely right. And then let the individual play their best game. But that's what we tried to do in this. And at the end of the day, I saw it in the military as I mentioned earlier. We had health care not because we want to spend the money on health care. We wanted to keep the youth in and with their families because they were covered and they were productive warriors. Man, they could do the job. Why are we losing $150 billion a year in productivity because of the under and uninsured? And let's do it in a cost-efficient way. Right. Let's talk about foreign policy for a second. Uh, you, know, you were an admiral in the Navy. You were in the war zones. Um, last week, the president flew to Afghanistan and signed a, an agreement President Karzai to maintain some U.S. presence in Afghanistan for 10 years after most of the troops are withdrawn in two years. What do you see as our continuing mission in that part of the world? There's only one mission that we have there, and should be, and I've argued it for the past two years. It is the Al-Qaeda that may be remaining within Pakistan. And so any presence that is to remain has to have that as its primary purpose. As it also says to Pakistan, look, don't bet on the come that Afghanistan is going to 
fall apart. And you will team with the Taliban, the creature you originally created to try to have power in there so you can better oppose India. Because we're leaving a little bit of residual force to take out Al-Qaeda and the Taliban that protect them over there in your country. And we're not gonna stop it. So be aligned with us, not against us. And finally, to Iran, who is funding covertly arms the Taliban to say, don't you bet on the con either. So it's a small mission, but the Al-Qaeda once eradicated, that is really what it's about. We cannot afford to have Pakistan fail, have the Taliban once more close within 60 miles of its capital, to where if they do take over that country with Al-Qaeda, a global terrorist organization that we're decimating, assuredly, all of a sudden has access to the nuclear material that is present in that country. Nuclear weapons, nuclear trained scientists. That is the only sole remaining mission by a small presence <coughs> as they continue to train the Afghanistan army. But it's the Al-Qaeda that it really brought us there and it should be, once gone, needs to be deployed. President Obama is getting a bit of criticism for people are saying politicizing the, the killing of Osama bin Laden. Uh, what's your feeling yeah. uh, about that criticism? Do so, you think it's justified? Do you think he's justified in taking credit? I, this is what I believe, particularly as a military person. I do believe we should walk softly, carry a big stick, and when we use it, John, I do believe we should talk softly. I think we have more respect. That said, I do understand after getting hit by certain <coughs> people of saying he doesn't know what he's doing. When in fact, he has actually, after 40 years where the Democratic Party has been in a deficit of not only national security credentials since Vietnam, wrongly, they've been in a deficit. <coughs> he has surely has demonstrated by what he's done over there and by how he's also ended the tragic misadventure in Iraq but has also focused our attention rightly into the Western Pacific, where the growing superpower of China is, not militarily only, I don't mean that, but diplomatically, <coughs> that he does own national security credentials. Now, I may not always agree with him, and I think his response to the criticism is probably what brings it more into the political sphere, but I'd like to see both parties return to the days that foreign policy was kind of set to the side a little bit yeah. and not used for, for points, as both sides have done. You remember the days oh, during yes. the Iraq War, the Democratic yes. Party is cut and run, they're going to be in our supermarkets. I remember uh, uh, so. Dick Cheney saying, <laughs> if John Kerry were arrested president, you'd be you'd not safe from a terrorist attack. And so, to me, to me is it there if it's understandable. I prefer, though, that we mm. talk softly, because I have to tell you, and even after the raid happened, because just the fact you go in and do it, Everybody over there that matters understands who we are. We don't need to struggle with how good we are. We are just that good. Well, that was uh, Teddy Roosevelt's uh, yes. famous line, uh, speak softly, but carry a big stick. And uh, uh, I, I won't even make a reference to uh, Joe Biden's <laughs> little slip up last yeah. week about that, but that was that will end up being humorous. Um, one of the big issues right now is voter ID. Uh, these ALEC sponsored laws in state after state, including here in Pennsylvania, um, to really keep people from voting. What do you think of that? What do you think needs to be, how do candidates and campaigns address this going into November? First, what do I think about it? If Tom Corbett as Attorney General for eight years did not prosecute one single case of voter fraud, where a person said, I'm somebody else and who I am. Why all of a sudden is it a problem? In fact, every study is showing you have less chance, John, of being hit by lightning as you and I sit here than a person ever committing voter fraud. So obviously it's being done for purposes that if you are able to make it more challenging for seniors, for those who are disabled, for those that tend to be poor, who often vote um, against the majority party here in Pennsylvania right now and for the other side, it's become a bit political. We should be, and I strongly feel this way, after having served 
to defend the right to vote, enticing more people in. Now, are there things that are done? Well, you know, okay, if, if you have a, uh, somebody who's the, the poll watcher there, or, you know, sitting in the polls and signing things, that's different, you know, signing some of these, than someone coming in and showing the identity. Look at right. Caroline, Pretending the there's somebody down else. there. She said, we have 978 voter frauds. When they went through it, they got it down to 10, and they can't even prove those 10 right. are. And so you have this in case after case. So I think that if the governor felt there was a problem, as attorney general, he would have done something about it because he's responsible for upholding the law. What do you think campaigns like the Obama campaign should do to prepare voters? Uh... Get out there and work it hard. Stop complaining about the problem. I just yeah. laid it out. Right. I'm not complaining about it. Every time I go to a college, yeah. get out there and do get them registered. It. Is it more challenging? Sure it is. But when I went to war for Afghanistan, you didn't complain about the Taliban? Yeah, beat them. <laughs> and, uh, and so my take on it is, okay, organize, organize, the organize. and then remember the lesson. If you're going to vote for the government, that you're not voting for. <laughs> because someone else is gonna be in that booth pulling the lever for you, right. not by fraud, but after the fact, so to speak, by saying, well, now I guess we'll pass these kinds of laws. Well, that's not what I'd like, then be out there and vote. Stay engaged. That's what I tell students, that's what I tell everyone. Don't complain, just get to work. Well, uh, a lot of your loss in 2010 and, and the Republican wave, that's what many, Democrats out of office that year were the result of Democrats not voting, liberals and progressives staying away from the polls. Uh, really, since 2008, uh, they haven't voted in Pennsylvania. Uh, how do you get them out this November? How do you motivate them? Well, you can do it. We did it. I mean, we came within two oh, yeah. points and everyone else was swept aside. Now, I had to do it better, and I didn't. And so that's why I'm still going around a lot. It's hard for me to turn down an event anybody asked me to speak at. And then for a while there, I was calling them and saying, would you like me to come yeah. and speak? And so just go about it as you do. It is 101. It is simple, hard work. Get your people organized, have them knock on doors, have them explain, get them out there. Can it be done? Sure, it can be done. People care. They just want to know that you're willing to work your butt off <laughs> to show yes. them that you care right. to a large degree because they've been let down by too many people. And this time, when you're in office, do what's right. It isn't about political decisions. This nation is yearning to follow someone. The state is that says, you may not always agree with me, but here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna tell you the facts and figures. I'm gonna listen. But at the end of the day, I'm gonna do this, not because I'm arrogant, but because I've explained what it is. I've listened. I've tried to come up with principal compromise. I'm willing to lose my job because Americans will benefit from it. Well, thank you very much, Joe. Thanks, Joe. Uh, it's been a good conversation. Thanks.